Caps and Stems Law at gmail.com. That's where you send your questions. Hope you guys all had a wonderful, what are we? Wednesday, hump day. Yes. Hope you all had a wonderful Tuesday and wonderful Wednesday today. Now that it's Wednesday evening, I guess I got to get caught up. Anyway, I've just been sitting here grinding along all day. We've got a um, pretty heavy docket actually right now. We have one over my limit actually against my better judgment. I took an additional case and, um, you know, we'll struggle our way through it. But anyway, tonight we have slated up for you. Gene Byrne, Volume 1, Part 1. And he's an interesting guy. I'd forgotten what a doofus this guy is. He's, he's actually really a doofus. But anyway, you'll see for yourself. Don't let me impose my judgment. You guys reach your own conclusions. But uh, we'll have Volume 2 of him up tomorrow. And James is sending me a little message here. He's got on Patreon, he has docket entries 1 through 300, all, all of them up there, except for a couple that were ordered sealed by the judge. One thing that you guys do have that uh, you may find interesting is all of the briefing from the um, defendants when they were trying to get the entire, um, like the entire case sealed, actually. But it was mainly targeting Harper and Craig McKay. But uh, all the briefings there, our oppositions are there, the judge's various orders are there, so you can sort of read through and track, you know, what happened, how it happened, and, you know, how generally they, they lost, which was cool. I had forgotten all about that, actually, and James needed some help figuring out what documents he could and could not put up, so I spent some time doing that with him today. It was pretty interesting. Um, so, yeah, go check it out on the Patreon uh, stuff if you're signed up. Also, to let you know, uh, he'll be doing an early release. All the Patreon subscribers get, you know, early release, release blah, 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 blah. start over earlier, early release videos. So James will be uploading the early release of the full version of Gene Burns um, tomorrow. And I don't remember if there were any references to the kids there. He may have had to bleep those out. So that might take a little extra time, but yeah, um, Anyway, yeah, for you Patreon people, it's up there or will be up there. Remember to look at the links in the description for tonight's live. It's got all the various links to our YouTube channel, the Rumble, all that stuff. And feel free to go in ahead and explore the YouTube channel. I've got a lot of other material up there besides just these videos. Um, there's some educational stuff, stuff for parents, stuff for attorneys, things like that. So just, you know, explore, look around, poke around, look at playlists. Uh, James said, you can, I guess, look at the channel statistics or something and kind of tell where people are going. All the stuff you want to look at, I think, is in playlists. So if I'm remembering correctly, anyway. Um, after the video today, I will be answering the questions that were sent to James at caps and stems law at gmail.com and i just put it up there in the chat just in case you guys don't already know it um, but i will be answering those questions and then i'll try to every now and then um you know pause if i see something interesting give you a little pra practice tip or pointer maybe explain what we're doing there as it um goes along or, or something i'll just do the best i can but either way i will be back at the end and we'll answer questions. And to the extent that I can, I'll try and address questions um, as they come up in the chats too. So anyway, with no further ado, here we go, Gene Burns. Good morning, Mr. Burns. Can you please state and spell for us your full name? Gene, G-E-N-E, -E, Mark, M-A-R-K, Burns, B-U-R-N-S. Mr. Burns, at one point in time, you worked for the state of Arizona, correct? I did. From when until when? From September of 1997 to March of 2015. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to break right here. I know it's not even, this isn't even a practice tip. This is like, I'm looking at the guy, he's in this bright freaking orange shirt. And the first thing that pops in my head is he's like a convict. I, I mean, I, he's not in real life. It's He's not. So I don't want to say anything defamatory. It's just the way he looks. He looks like he's walking right out of a prison cell. But uh, just so it's clear, I'm not saying he's a convict. I'm not saying he walked out of a prison cell. I'm just saying that's the way he looks. Beginning in 1997, which department did you work for? 
Child Protective Services. Did you continue working for Child Protective Services until March 2015? I did. In what capacity were you first employed back in 1997 by uh, Department of Children? I'm sorry, is it Child Protective Services you said? Yes, a program manager. What does a program manager do? Manage the field level. At that time it was for um, Child Protective Services in Maricopa County. Did your job duties change at all from 1997 to March 2015? Yes, Maricopa County was split, so I managed the western half of Maricopa County, Yuma County, and La Paz County. When did that split happen? I don't recall. I think somewhere around 2009 to 2010. And just so I'm with you, you, you then became the program manager for the western region? S southwestern region. Southwestern region. All right, what does a program manager do in 2009 and forward for the Southwest region? What did you do? What were your primary job duties? It managed the business operations of the Southwest region um, and for the Central region. I oversaw the deputy program manager who was responsible for the assistant program managers who were responsible for the supervisors. How many deputy program managers were under your supervision? One. I also managed the court liaison, um, the resource manager, um, remember who all I managed. I, I managed um, around seven people. Yes, okay, so we have the deputy program manager and then we had an assistant program manager. Assistant, What was that person? Assistant deputy manager? What do we call them? The, the deputy program manager um, was actually um, over the, assist, the field assistant program managers. Okay, and how many assistant program managers were there? I believe seven. And then the assistant, pro the assistant program managers, they had control over supervisors in the field, is that right? Yes. How many supervisors in the field were there in the southwest region during the time that you were the program manager? I, I can't recollect for sure. Um, usually each section had six to seven supervisors. And when you say uh, each section, are you referring to sections within the southwest region? Yes, so there were offices, let's just Avondale, and so there was in-home adoptions, the young adult program, that type of thing. Okay. So when we're talking about the sections, um, I'd like to focus just for a moment on sections that would normally be responding to uh, referrals that come in to the agency. What would we call those sections? Um, they had names. Mm -hmm. So a section such as Thunderbird would have three to four investigative units and then maybe three ongoing units and they took certain zip codes. Okay, so Thunderbird, I presume that refers to like a region within the larger southwestern region? Yes. Okay, and then you, you'd mentioned earlier like Avondale, would that also be a section? Yes. Okay, and that would have a similar composition where we have three to four investigative units and then we would have three or so ongoing services units? Yes, Avondale had, oh, it was a little different in the fact that it was co-located with a, with a police unit. Okay. And then when we talk about three to four investigative units, what do you mean when we're talking about an investigative unit? What is that? Investigative unit? Yeah. Um, they take reports um, from the hotline um, that are prioritized by priority, which is assigned by the hotline. Okay. And then what do they do with those reports? 
they go out to them, go out on those reports and meet the response time assigned by the hotline. Um, so they would look at the, any priors that may have, and they may staff that with their supervisor prior to going out. Uh, this is actually just in response to Goddess of Kratos, just because it's easier to tell you verbally than um, by typing the message. We, we're looking into the closed captioning for Morris. Um, the problem is on the lives, there isn't any closed captioning option. But if he does playback once YouTube processes it, then they do have the uh, subtitles, right? Yeah. Yeah. It takes like a day yeah, but it watch. takes like a day. It takes like a day for YouTube to get that put together. So, you know, other other than that, there's really not an easy answer. Oh, should I add you in? No. Okay, just. For my own understanding, just make sure I'm clear. And if I'm wrong on any of this, please interrupt me, stop me, and correct me so I don't go down a rabbit trail. Um, but so far, what I think I'm understanding is a, a call will come into the hotline, and somebody will take that call, they'll write up whatever the referral or the complaint is. That will then get assigned to a person, an investigator, who will then go out into the field and start interviewing witnesses or investigating the allegations of the referral. Do I have it right so far? The hotline will assess whether it meets the criteria of a report. If it meets the criteria of a report, it will be sent to a particular unit who has um, that assigned zip code. The supervisor then will decide who gets that, what investigator gets that report. Okay, so, so once it's been decided that yes, this hotline call meets the criteria for a referral, then the referral will get generated and sent out to a um, unit, an investigation unit. Object, just for clarification, you use the term referral. He uses the term report, uh, just so we're talking about the same thing. Okay, do you, do you guys use referrals when you get a... The, the term is report. A okay. call goes in. The term is report. Okay. So I guess every government agency does it a little different. Out in California, they call them refer hotline referrals. Um, but reports then. So, so if the report meets the criteria, um, it will get assigned to a investigator somewhere, whether that's by a supervisor or some other staffing unit. And then that investigator is supposed to go out in the field and actually interview witnesses and follow up on the allegations of the report. Is that right? Yes. Now, there's some circumstances where a report may get generated and uh, the investigator goes out and detains the child. That happens, right? Could you clarify that? Well, how do children come within the custody of the agency that you used to work for? Okay. Um, in Arizona, a, an investigator has the right to remove a child with it for 72 hours if they feel the child is at risk of imminent harm. A child uh, and also a voluntary foster care agreement can be signed by uh, a family member placing that child into care for 72 hours or um, another way kids come into care is family members who can go to the self-help center at court and a petition is filed and those kids are placed into the custody of the department. Okay, let's focus just for a moment. Okay, before we get into this, I'm gonna refocus the guy because he just didn't answer the question, he gave him a whole bunch of extraneous crap. But uh, the first thing that he said is that we have the right um, to take the kid if there's some danger within 72 hours or some shit like that, whatever it was, but that is in direct conflict with Ninth Circuit law. We've gone over this, I think, with you guys in nearly every one of these videos, but you know what the law is by now, or you should, and that's that a social worker, government social worker, cannot lawfully remove a child from the custody of its parents unless at the time of the removal, that worker is in possession of what? 
specific and articulable facts to show the child's in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death in the time it takes to get a what? A warrant, which is usually two to three hours. And remember, it's a two-part test. There is no lesser intrusive alternative means to avert the specific injury the social worker is concerned about. So this guy's bullshit that he just spouted is in direct contravention of Ninth Circuit law, just so you know. On the situation where um, one of your investigators gets assigned a report, they go out in the field to investigate the report. Are you telling me that that investigate tour on their own can remove the child from the custody of its parents if the investigator feels that the child is in danger of some sort? Based on their interviews, based on what they're seeing in the home, um, usually they will call their supervisor. Um, they will get a um, little staff over the phone what they're saying, and if that supervisor agrees, they can remove. Is there some sort of criteria or something that has to be met before we can remove a child from their home without getting a court order? Um, the department has a risk, um, a risk assessment tool they use. What's that called? It's been a long time, so it's been 15 months. I think they've changed it. I think it's a child risk safety assessment. Is that a computerized tool? No. Okay, describe it for me. How does, how does this risk assessment work? Um, people are changed, um, <clears throat> trained on it. It assesses very, various domains, um, 17 risk um, safety factors. I've been away from it for 15 months, so I couldn't I couldn't give you the risk factors. Sure. When did you When did the department begin first begin using this risk assessment tool? I can't tell you that. I don't I don't recollect. But it was sometime between 1997 when you began as a program manager and March 2015. Yes, there's been various um, tools used, and it's been modified several times. And when you call this a tool, maybe I'm misinterpreting, correct me if I'm wrong, but normally when I'm talking about a tool, since it's not a computer program or a computerized tool, there must be some sort of forms or something that you use to administer this tool. There, there is a document. So there, there is a document. And what is, just described for me, what is that document composed of? What does it look like? It has 17 risk factors, domains. And these risk factors on the document, are there questions maybe that the social worker it, has it, to it answer? It goes or through. I I we, we, wait till he's done before you start to answer. Yeah, I should have given you know, that little instruction at the beginning. I presume you haven't been deposed before, is that correct? I'm sorry, what? You have not been deposed before? Not in the state of Arizona. Okay. Basically, one of the rules is you can see that she's trying to type down everything that we say. And one thing that's very important for her to do that is that we not talk at the same time. Otherwise, it gets very difficult. But, uh, you know, that's not your fault. That's my fault for not letting you know. Um, so anyway, this risk assessment tool, am I correct that it's these 17 domains that you talked about? There's a series of questions associated with those 17 domains. 17 safety factors. Okay, there's a risk of questions associated with those 17 safety factors. There's 17 risk safety factors that you have to assess whether they're there. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I don't particularly remember them. It's been 15 months and I, don't, I didn't use it daily because I was removed from the field. Did, did you ever participate in the administration of any training for the social workers or the investigators that were under your management at your office? I did. Okay. Did you ever participate in administering any training specifically relative to the use of these risk assessment tools? Did I train the document? Is that what you're asking? Did you participate in training on the document? 
I participated in the training. I did not train the document. What does that mean? I participated in the training of the document, but I did not train the document to staff. When you say you participated in the training on the risk assessment tool, what do you mean? The department has specialists that train mm -hmm. on the risk assessment tool. Okay. And how did you participate in that effort? I sat in the training. So you actually sat through a training? Mm-hmm. Yes. Is that yes? Yes. More than one? Uh, Sorry, guys, I had to unmute that. It's like, what? You, you couldn't hear it. You could probably see my mouth moving, saying, what the fuck? He sat in on the training. He's the freaking director of the agency at the time all this stuff happened. And he didn't even know what the training was. He, he had to sit in on the training. It's unbelievable, this stuff. It's, it, it's, I don't know, man. Truth is stranger than fiction, or however that thing goes. Yes, I sat when they had various modifications of the document. Okay. Roughly, just give me an estimate, how many of those trainings did you sit through? Between five and ten or something like that? I don't know, probably more than five. So you should have a general understanding about how the tool is used in the field. I do. Okay, can you go ahead and explain that to me? You're going to have an assessment of if the kid is at risk, you're going to look at, you're going to, when you interview the child, when you interview, look at the home, look for various safety risk and hazards. You're going to look for whether or not there is abuse in the home, whether or not there's domestic violence, <coughs> whether or not there's substance abuse. You're going to look at a wide array, a array of issues. Well, when you say wide array, that's the 17 risk factors? Safety factors. Or safety factors? It, it, yes, but you're going to look at past. Was there a history of abuse in the past? Was there any other allegations in the family? And am I correct that before the decision to seize or detain a child is made, the worker out in the field must do this risk assessment? Not necessarily. If, a, if, if an investigator feels that the child, if they would leave, is at risk, mm -hmm. they can pull the child. When you say at risk, explain that to me. What do you mean? So if that investigator feels that if they left the home, the child would be in danger, mm -hmm. they should pull a child. How long does it take in uh, Maricopa County if the social worker feels like they, they can't leave the home? How long does it take them to get a warrant form, to remove the child? Form a foundation and, uh, well, form a foundation at this point. If you know the answer to that, I... I, I, I we, I'm not familiar with using the term warrant, so we don't do warrants in Arizona. Let me do a little bit differently. You were the program manager for the South. Okay, that was like, and he doesn't even know what a gift that was. I mean, that's like right there. They don't do warrants in Arizona. Okay, that's sort of like what we've been working on the whole time. Well, they do warrants in Arizona now, because they went ahead and, uh, you know, enacted a statute requiring warrants. But again, if you go to the federal courts and you say, hey, look, judge, they just don't even get warrants in Arizona. At least our theory was that that should in and of itself yield a preliminary injunction. So it didn't. We lost that motion. But ultimately, it had a similar effect because it was about that time we started, uh, you know, I was meeting with some legislators and Greg McKay, like during his depo, you know, he's all, yeah, we're going to look into that. We're, we're going to work on that. And they actually took, I brought and gave uh, McKay the litigated, highly litigated warrant training from Orange County and said, hey, look, you know, if you don't want to see me here again, take this training and give it to your workers. And, you know, I, I don't know if they did that exactly, but he said he was going to take it, look at it. And then I do know that they did roll out 
a whole bunch of new warrant training just the last few years. So no litigation has an impact. And I think that we did have an impact with the Pellerin case, at least in Arizona. Southwest region for about 18 years, is that right? 17 and a half. 17 and a half years. In that entire 17 and a half years, did you ever see a circumstance where one of your field workers obtained a court order permitting them to detain a child from the custody of its parents? Okay, let me just explain the practice. Sure. Okay, but basically you do not need a warrant to, for DCS if you read the statute to remove a child. And when you say if you read the statute, you mean the state statute? Yes. Okay, what are the circumstances under which one of your workers could remove a child without a warrant? Okay. I, I'm sorry, I thought I explained that. Um, if a investigator goes to the home and they believe the child is at intimate harm, mm -hmm. uh, and should they leave, that child would be at risk, they would call their supervisor, staff it. They can. Supervisor, staff? If they would staff the situation with their supervisor, then they could issue a removal notice. Okay. The worker couldn't do that on their own. They would have to get uh, agreement from their supervisor? If the supervisor is not there, they may call another supervisor or the acting supervisor. Okay, but there would definitely have to be supervised, some supervisor involvement in the decision to seize that child. Assumes facts, objection. It, I cannot say that for sure. According to policy, the policy that was in place when you were in charge, what was the policy? That varied sometimes depending on the um, experience of the worker. All right, all right, hold on, hold on. I gotta pause it. Okay, I, I don't get it. All right, he's in charge, he's the director, he's the captain of the ship, right? And policy, that's policy with a big P, not practice, policy like in writing. And he's the guy, he's the guy that, you know, is in charge. He says, essentially he doesn't know the policy or maybe there is no policy, it varies by the circumstances. Like what the fuck? This this was crazier than I thought. I'm, I'm getting excited about it now. I, I, I don't remember what was going through my head then but it doesn't sound like I'm excited about it. I, I think I should have been excited about it, but you know, it's easy to be a Monday morning quarterback like four years later. Somewhere in policy that depending on the experience of the worker, that worker can go ahead and make the decision on their own? I can't tell you that, I don't know. Okay, so as the program manager, that's not something you If you know. had a, an experienced staff, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know if that was in writing. Did you participate at all in drafting or promulgating the written policies that govern the work that your subordinates did? I did if it was a district operating procedure. The procedure to detain a child from the custody of its parents, would that have been a written procedure or one that just sort of was done in practice? That would have been in the, uh, the um, state manual. State manual, okay. And your recollection of the state manual is that under the statute, depending on the experience of the field worker, they may or may not need to consult with their supervisor. Object to form mistakes. Definitely. I can't, I don't know, is it, I don't know if it's in the manual. I can't remember. Okay, so, but you do recall that as a matter of practice, it was permissible under your command for experienced field workers to seize children sometimes without consulting a supervisor. If, if you were a social worker for or something like that, or you're an acting supervisor, yes, but usually the norm was you called your supervisor. Okay. And get supervisor approval. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like, yes. You have to answer audibly. Because that was the norm, the supervisory approval. Okay. And when we're talking about risk, you, you, you described this for me a little bit earlier, that if the child is in, I think you said, imminent risk of harm, what are we talking about there, imminent risk of harm? What does that mean in layman's terms? It means if they left, would the child be at risk of being hurt 
or severely neglected. Is that it? Pretty much. When you say at risk of being hurt, is there some degree of injury that we're talking about there, or could a scraped knee be sufficient? I didn't catch the last part. Well, you said if the child's at risk of being hurt, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering, what does that mean? If you look at the reasons for the report, if a child is going to be at risk of being abused again, um, depending on the, if it's a neglect case, depending on the conditions of the home, is it a hazard, it's all going to be individual. Do you, do you have any understanding, or did, let me ask it this way, did you gain any understanding while you were the program manager for the Southwest region, did you gain any understanding that the, the work that you guys were doing out there was governed by Ninth Circuit law? Anybody ever tell you that? We were governed by the Federal Review, yes, and then uh, our cases were reviewed by the feds, yes, I, I'm aware of that. Well, my question is really more specific than that. You understand that in the United States, we basically have a dual legal system. One is federal law, the other state law. You understand that, right? Is that a yes, sir? Yes. Let me tell you, I'm not the policy person at DCS. So the policy is set at what was central office, so I follow the manual. Does that make sense? That they send you? Yes. Okay. I understand that. My, my, I'm not there yet. We're going to get there probably a little later in the day. What, what I'm looking for now is just to sort of get a general idea of what your level of understanding is with respect to just the general law that governed the work that you and your subordinate workers were doing you know, back uh, between 1997 and 2015. So let me ask the question again. You, you, yourself, do understand that we have a system where federal law and state law both apply to the work that you're doing for CPS, right? I do understand that federal law was incorporated into the mandates that we okay. address. Do you have any understanding as to whether or not the state of Arizona is in the Ninth Circuit? Yes. You do know that? Yes, because I, I know it's in the Federal Review. Okay. And being in the Ninth Circuit, you also understand that the work that, that CPS is doing here in Arizona is governed by Ninth Circuit law. You understand that? And that would be under the jurisdiction of juvenile court. Well, hold on. You, that doesn't really answer my question. My question is, you understand. I, I, I don't, I'm not asking about jurisdictions. I'm not an expert, but I, it, it does make logical sense to me. Okay. When you were program manager, were you ever, did you ever participate in any meetings or conferences, management uh, groups, anything like that, where the application of Ninth Circuit law was, was discussed? No. No. Okay. But. Not that I recall. Let me put it that way. But irrespective of that, it's your understanding that the work that your social workers and investigators, that your CPS agents were doing during your tenure in management, that it was governed exclusively by the state statutes. Object form, misstates testimony. Am I right about that? I'm sorry, what? I'm just objecting. You can go ahead and answer. Okay. Yeah. Yes, and the, and the manual. Okay. I'm going to show you what we will mark as exhibit number 63. I'm familiar with it. Okay. Before we get into it, um, I'll ask you, and you may not have heard this before, you may not be familiar, just let me know. Have you ever heard that in order to remove a child from the custody of its parents without a warrant, the CPS agent must have reasonable and articulable evidence to suggest that the child is in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death. 
and the time it would take to get a warrant. Have you ever heard that statement or something like it? No. So that's not a rule that Arizona follows? Object to form, just not, first of all, there's no foundations of what Arizona follows. He can say what he knows. Well, he can he answer that. Are, are you instructing him? Well, I'm telling you, I'm objecting to the form of the questions. Okay, that's the, facts, and that's, he has no foundation for this, and you've said no foundation. That's, that's the objection, and you can't coach him. The objection is that you object as to the form of the question. Thank you. I'll ask the question again. Actually, if I can just have you reread the question. All I would. right. Is it, is it down after this? A what? Is it down after this? Just play. Oh, well, I was going to give him a little practice point. Oh, you mean the video's yeah. done after? Oh, okay. Well, let's let the video finish then. Appreciate it. Oh, okay, there we go. So anyway, that last little blurb at the end, I, I'm going to go ahead and play it. Uh, can I play it again? Yeah, let's scrub to it. Oh, Good sorry. morning, Mr. Burns. Find it. We'll play that. Did again. you ever part Arizona fall in familiar? Just let me know. Uh, where the hell was that? I think it's like right in there. Sense to suggest child is in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily or death in the time it would this. take to get a warrant. Have you ever heard that statement or something like it? No. So that's not a rule that Arizona follows? Object to form, just not, first of all, he has no foundations of what Arizona follows. He can say what he knows. Well, he can he answer that. Are, are you instructing him? Well, I'm telling you, I'm objecting to the form of the question. Okay, the that's, facts, the, that's and he has no foundation for this, and you've said no foundation. That's, that's the objection, then you can't coach him. The objection is that you object as to the form of the question. Thank you. I'll ask the question again. Okay. Actually. So this is the deal. Is uh, sometimes what will happen, in fact, frequently, th this, this guy, actually, Jim Bowen, was pretty good about it. He's a decent guy, a nice guy, actually. We got, we got along fairly well on the case. I don't have anything uh, really negative to say about him. He, he's an honorable guy throughout, for the most part. Um, but what a lot of attorneys, especially, especially L.A. attorneys, will do is they will use their objections as a means to coach their witness into a more favorable, you know, more defense favorable um, answer. And what, you'll see it in some of the other depots, especially in Duval. Um, you know, they just, they, the attorney just basically wants to answer the question and they'll say, objection, locks foundation. There's no way on earth that they would know X, Y, Z. And instead it's this other thing. And they'll just go on and on and on. That's called coaching. It's totally inappropriate. Remember, the rule is that depositions are to be conducted as if the examination were taking place at trial. At trial, you cannot do speaking objections. All you can do is objection, legal basis, wait for the judge to rule, and then either move on or re-ask the question or whatever. But you don't get to sit there and do these fact-laden objections to suggest to your witness maybe how they should answer the question. So that's why I was kind of jumping in his shit there a little bit when he started wanting to argue his position. The proper way for him to have objected, if he thought it was lax foundation, which means you know the guy doesn't have any personal knowledge to know the answer to the question, um, then he would just say objection, lax foundation, end of story, no more discussion. But in uh, Arizona, in front of this particular judge, the judge is keen to the idea that lawyers like to coach their witnesses during testimony. So he actually had a local rule saying you can't even say the legal basis for your objection. All you can do is object to the form of the question, object to form. All other objections are preserved. Unless there's privilege, then you have to assert the privilege. And that's it. So when he started going off talking about, you know, foundation and he can only testify about this and that. That's why I shut his shit down. He says, like, no, the local rule here, objection to form, that's it. Shut the fuck up. Let's get the answer. So anyway, just a little practice pointer. Don't let the attorneys, um, you know, screw you up in your depot and don't get distracted when they start wanting to argue with you or, or um, you know, get you off your beat by interposing, you know, serial objections that, you know, are just bullshit. Because that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to screw with your flow and trying to coach their witness. Don't let them do it. Just ignore it. The witness still has to answer the question unless they're instructed by their attorney not to answer the question. So, you know, you guys will probably run into some fights on this. It might be prudent. Um, 
Uh, maybe I should do a class on how to do a depot. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. We'll think about that. Maybe that's something that we'll think about. Yeah. So let me see. Before I get to the questions for tonight, let's see if we have. Um, I just asked that question to Caps and Stems. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. What's this one? During your deposition, do your clients ever sit in on? Yes. In fact, uh, this is Carissa. In fact, um, unless they have a really good excuse to not be there, I require my clients to be at every deposition. And, and the reason for that is this was their life. They were there. They were experiencing these things. This is their story. I'm really just a mouthpiece. They're my best resource. I don't know necessarily, you know, what really went down or when somebody's lying to me. And what I'll do is I'll have my client, they'll be sitting right to my right typically, and they'll have a little sticky pad. And a lot of lawyers hate this. They, they don't want their clients to be throwing them sticky notes or anything else. It's distracting and all they have all these excuses. I don't know. But um, I give my clients a sticky pad and I tell them, look, if I'm in a line of questioning and you think there's something I've missed or that I should get into, you write it down in big block letters. Because if you're scratching it out, I won't be able to read it. It'll fuck everything up. Write it out in big block letters and just hand it to me. Don't worry if I'm in the middle of a question or anything else. I will get to it. You won't distract me. I'm very focused. I'll get. I'll, I'll try to stay right on it. Um, but yeah, I look at my clients as the, the biggest resource there. And I've got direct access to tap into that at any time. And, and you know, the defendants, they don't have shit. So yeah, I demand that the clients be there. Um, do Patreon uh, do Patreon subscribers get to participate in mock trials? Huh, that's an interesting idea. You know, you know, we do focus groups for our cases. The problem that I would have with you guys as focus group participants is that you're totally biased. So I, I wouldn't really be able to get a good feel for what the average juror in the particular venue is going to think about, you know, a presentation or an issue. Because I already know what you guys are all. You're going to think the same thing I think. And that's that's going to be more like an echo chamber. So I'm not sure that that would be very beneficial. But I don't know. It's something we can kick around. Um, let's see. Two general ask the witness to tell a story. Argumentative. Challenging. Um, yeah, we can talk about. Send me a caps and stems question about the various objections. We can do a whole lecture on that. If someone does not show a depot, if somebody didn't show up for a deposition and it was properly noticed or on a subpoena, I would take a record of non-appearance and then I would go to the judge and I would compel the deposition. Um, and I think that looks, uh, yeah, I think that looks like it. So let me go to the questions that came into Caps and Stems. Um, James put together a nice list here for me. We'll talk, uh, Marissa Hernandez. We'll do yours first. Is a parent consider, considered a, quote, state loser, end quote, when they file their complaint after a child returns home? For example, a child who aged out of the system. Um, again, this, this is sounding like a Rooker-Feldman issue. And... Remember, again, as long as we are not challenging the underlying judgment, Rooker-Feldman should not come into play. But let's say, for example, assuming that it did come into play, then, yeah, you're still a state loser because even, the, even though the child's home with you, you still lost the jurisdictional question or the detention question. And so, yeah, you're still a state loser in that sense. So it, it doesn't matter if the child's home or not. I, I hope that makes sense. Anyway, can a PO box be used instead of a physical address in federal civil cases? You know, I don't know. I'd have to look at the local rules for that and find out. I think, I think that I think it can actually, because I know of a pro per plaintiff that I helped out with some stuff. And he's using a P.O. box. So I believe it can be, but you'd want to check your local rules just to make sure. The CV is civil. What does, and this is the question, what does, quote, CV, end quote, mean in a federal civil case number? It's civil. If it's a criminal case, it'll have some other moniker. Um, next question, can a child assert a retaliation claim 
when the retaliatory action was against the parent that resulted in the removal? This is a really interesting question. Um, and it, it's kind of a cutting edge question, actually. I had this exact question in a case that I just settled up in um, Oakland, in Northern California. And what had happened there is the grandfather was very, very aggressive in litigating to get, to get his granddaughter uh, back out of the system. And, you know, the social workers, that they, they were worried. He, he told them flat out he's going to sue every fucking one of them. And so what they did is they retaliated against him, started lying about him in their reports in the court, and all the normal things they do. And the outfall of their retaliation against him was that the granddaughter languished in this screwed up situation, you know, for a couple of years, actually several years. And um, so our theory there, in addition to, you know, the violation of her liberty interest through the deception itself, or the presentation of the deceptive evidence itself was that, hey, they intended to retaliate against grandpa, but there's this, this um, tort doctrine called transferred intent. You usually see it in battery cases where, for example, maybe two of you are standing side by side and I say, I'm going to slap you and I accidentally hit the person next to you instead. It's still going to be an intentional battery because I intended to hit somebody but that intent gets transferred to the actual victim. So that was our theory. Now, I, I didn't end up really testing that theory legally because the case settled before it got in front of the judge, but that was the theory we were pursuing. I really didn't have any case law to support it. It was just something I kind of, you know, cooked up and pulled out of my ass and thought it made sense. So I don't know. I guess that's a long way to say, I don't actually know but it's worth a shot and I have tried it, but it hasn't been tested. And I think that's the best answer I have for you. Um, Susan Schofield, you're the next one. Question is what issues can be appealed on a granted motion to dismiss? Well, this is the thing. If there's any part of the case left after the motion to dismiss, then there's no final judgment. There's an appellate rule. It's called the one final judgment rule. And what that means is, is you can't sever decisions and appeal them independently. You have to appeal from the final judgment in the case and all appealable decisions merge into that judgment. So let's say that you had eight causes of our claims for relief were in federal court. So you had eight claims for relief and only six of them got dismissed on the 12B6 motion. You have nothing to appeal until those other two get blown out and a judgment's entered against you. You have to be in a brief party. Judgment's entered against you. Then you can appeal all the mistakes you think were made on all the prior issues. But, you know, as the matter stands, if your case was not completely dismissed, you, you can't really appeal yet. If the case was completely dismissed, then you'll need to get a judgment of dismissal entered because you can only appeal from a judgment, not the order dismissing the case, but from a judgment. So once the judge dismisses the case, you'll need to file a um, you know, request for entry of a judgment of dismissal. And then from there, you go ahead and file your appeal. I, I think that answers your question. Um, this next question, it seems that DCFS intentionally slanders everyone in order to get the intended result. Has this, has this ever been used in a federal complaint and does it go anywhere if it is? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Look at, I think the Pellerin case, we, used, we had a judicial deception claim in there. The lady was lying all over the place. And that was, I believe that was one of our claims. I can go back and double check. But we'll be posting other cases, too. Once we finish off with Pellerin, we'll, we'll, I don't know, what do you have slated up next after Pellerin? I don't know. Uh, well, we'll figure one out. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll find a judicial deception case and you know, start posting one of those once we finish with Pellerin. But, uh, yeah, it happens all the time. And, yes, there, there's actually a claim for relief specifically called judicial deception. It's a substantive due process claim. And, um, yeah. Yeah, we file those all the time. Uh, okay, Kristen Michelle. I think that's Free Wrigley, right? Yeah. I think so. Uh, what is the CAPS? <laughs> uh, did she really ask this? Yeah. 
uh, okay. Well, um, puzzle pieces of love. Yeah, the caps are a certain type of puzzle piece, and the stems are another type of puzzle piece, and the cap would be the top of the stem. So no, I don't think you're missing anything really. I think that's that's you probably pretty much got the right idea. Okay, Nigel Bliss. If you had done a case combining wrongful removal and malicious prosecution, uh, yeah, I've actually got one of those filed right now. It's the Hipschman case, and it's um, I just filed the amended complaint. Actually, I expect motions to dismiss coming soon. I added a malicious prosecution claim to it based on the judicial deception. You know, I had the the warrantless removal, then warrantless medical exams then judicial deception in the detention report. And then uh, because the case, ultimately the judge dismissed it before finding jurisdiction. So he never found jurisdiction, but the county pursued it all the way through to the end, causing the parents to have to spend a whole shit ton of money in defense. And um, they got a favorable termination. So those are the elements for a malicious prosecution. It was done without probable cause with malice and we got favorable termination. So yes, and in fact, a little twist to it, instead of doing a state law-based malicious prosecution claim, under 1983, 42 U.S.C. Section 1983, you can also do a malicious prosecution claim because it is a violation of due process under the 14th Amendment. And I, I found a case on that. So I'll see if we can't dig up, um, maybe if you can make a note on it, we could upload uh, the Hitchman complaint to the Patreon. Okay. And that way people can see how we did that. I don't know if it's going to work or not. The motions to dismiss haven't even been filed. But, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Tonight you guys are ask, asking some pretty cutting-edge questions. I'm, I'm actually pretty impressed. You guys are out learning stuff, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. It's not for me because I never, I never said any of this. You guys are cooking this up on your own, but I'm pretty impressed with your questions tonight. Uh, next one. Can I have the case name number to look up the complaint on PACER? Or can we get a copy of the complaint on Patreon as well as more discussion regarding this dual system interplay based on common fabricated facts, omissions that is the moving force for both legal processes? I'm not sure I understand your question. I'm going to have to ask you to break it down and articulate it a little better. I'm not sure what you're looking for. I apologize for that. You know, it could be that it's just me because I've been grinding on discovery documents all day and my brain's kind of mushy. But um, yeah, I'm going to ask you to try to reframe that question, Nigel, and send it back to James at Caps and Stems. And I'll go ahead and put that in the chat group. Yeah, send it back to James at Caps and Stems and we'll try, we'll try the next time. Um, then the next question was in that same live around the 43 minute mark, which, which live? In that same live around the 43 minute mark, Sean discussed lack of exigent circumstances regarding unwarranted hospital seizures and the time it takes to get a warrant with an example of a SBS, oh, shaken baby. AHT case where parents are at hospital and the child is seized by CPS after cap workup. Have you been successful in litigating that wrongful seizure in that specific circumstance where lesser intrusive? Yeah, look at uh, RCV Children's Hospital. It's a uh, appellate, California appellate case, and it was a shaken baby case. Um, God, I don't know the site off the top of my head, but that was one of our cases. It's published opinion actually changed California law. What, what they did is they took all the Ninth Circuit law that we've been working on all the time and just migrated it and said, this applies in all of these cases in California state courts. And then after that case, I started lobbying a guy. Um, his last name's Greenlee. I don't remember his first name, but he basically works for the Judicial Council and specifically on uh, revising and reforming and updating jury instructions. And we got him to write a jury instruction uh, for California under CACI. I think it's 3052. Maybe it's 3050. I don't remember. 3050, 3051, 3052, something like that for um, 42 U.S.C. Section 1983 relative to uh, unwarranted seizures. And then the next year with our decision in... Um, 
Marshall, Marshall versus County of San Diego, got back a hold with the guy and got him to write a similar jury instruction, but for judicial deception. So now in California, if you bring one of these cases in state court, you've got a jury instruction already written that the courts will use for both warrantless seizure and for judicial deception. I don't know if that actually answered your question, but um, I think it did. And we're still on Nigel. It says, in Oregon, parents are not required to sign safety plans. The CPS worker just imposes them. Wouldn't this constitute an unwarranted seizure depending on the safety plan? Well, yeah, it could. I mean, think about it. You have this fundamental right to custody, care, control, and supervision of your child. If the safety plan impairs or interferes or diminishes or denigrates in any way that bundle of rights, then, yeah, arguably that you know, no, no matter how minor it is, it could be an unwarranted interference. So that's something to look at. Um, it says a while back, this is the next question. A while back, Sean posted the most badass attorney job posting ever. That's James. Yeah, I didn't post shit. It's all James. <laughs> all, all I do here is sit and talk and he's taking content that we've generated over 15 years of litigation and he's putting it together and that's that's all james so well, he said who wrote, who wrote? Uh, read the question again it says a while back sean posted the most badass attorney oh the job posting <laughs> <laughs> yeah i wrote that i wrote that and and yes i did hire somebody it's evan he's sitting uh over there to my left but I would hire James. He's just not excited to work for me. <laughs> Are you? No, I kind of already am. Not really. This is like your project. I guess. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I guess. I guess. But uh, since your caseload is full limited, this is the next question. Since your case full is caseload is full slash limited, do you ever work with other firms or pro hoc certain aspects of the case or consult? Yeah, we, we team cases with other firms all the time. We get brought in on all kinds of stuff for specific purposes. Um, a good example is Keats uh, v. Coyle. I was brought in specifically just to try the case. I ended up doing a lot more work in it than that. But uh, And we lost at trial. That, that, that's a whole different story behind that. But um, yeah, we got our asses handed to us like a chewed up old hat. That was a that was a real beating. But um, but yeah, we 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 team cases all the time with other firms. We do pro hoc vice. In fact, all my work in Arizona was done pro hoc vice, and um, we do case consults, but very rarely. I mean, it, it takes a lot of work to give anybody meaningful advice or assistance on their case. If I'm going to do that kind of work then I'll probably end up just coming in on it. So, but anyway, I think that's it for the questions here. Let me see if you guys have any more questions that I missed. Um, oh, Janie, yeah, no problem, man. Say hi to your mom. Glad she could come in and listen anyway. Uh, complaint for the grandfather case. Um, yeah, we can put that up. James, that's going to be uh, Shanks, if you can get that up on the Shanks complaint. Probably do the first amended complaint. So what were the things you wanted me to do? Uh, I don't remember. I'm sure somebody took notes and they'll, they'll send you a thing. That, yeah, James wasn't writing down what it was that <laughs> we were wanting to post for you guys. So if somebody remembers, can you shoot him an email at Caps and Stems and he'll get that up? But yeah, if the Shanks first amended complaint, you're gonna put that up there. I'm tired too. He says he's tired too. He just got done working out. I wanted to put him on the camera tonight, but he keeps refusing. If you know, I don't see um, before there can be an appeal. I've been waiting to ask you a question, which I indicated message here it is. There was motion for dismissal that the judge never issued an order judgment on, and therefore my appeal still does not count, and therefore wouldn't that toll? Um, maybe, maybe not. It depends on how long you waited. If if you're just, you know, 20 days, 30 days, 45 days, then yeah, you, you know, maybe you can get something done there. Um, but I don't know. I don't know enough about your situation to really tell you what you might try doing. I mean, it can't hurt is just 
make a request for entry of judgment of dismissal. And then if he does it, you know, appeal it. Uh, let's see. Do you have any notes or docs on the grandpa case? Uh, we have a bunch of documents. I'll have to look and see what we can put up because we just settled the case. It's not final yet. And the client's not really very keen on any kind of like media coverage or anything like that. So let, let's sit on that one for a little bit. And, you know, I can go ahead and um, I'll talk to the client and see how she feels about it. If we put it up on Patreon, then it's like not open generally to the public. It's just certain people. So we might be able to do that. I'll talk to her about it, though. Think, Miss, uh, can you share that jury instruction on Patreon, James? What, which one? CACI, I think it's 3015 and 3051 or 3051 and 3052, something like that. For what? On their jury instructions. Uh, Melissa wants them. For which uh, case? They're just jury instructions. Oh, they're okay. not for any case. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've never signed a single thing. I'm not sure what that relates to. Yeah, the grandpa case, it was uh, Shanks. No, I'm sorry. It's not Shanks. It's ES. The initials ES versus County of Alameda. And I don't know the case number off the top of my head, but um, you can probably look it up on Pacer, I would think. Uh, Free Wrigley says, we all got to support James. Either charge like five bucks on Patreon a month or something or set something up. We appreciate you. I think he is charging. On, yeah. You are charging on Patreon, right? Yeah. He is charging on Patreon, and he very much appreciates you guys subscribing, too. It makes him... Uh, feel like his work is valuable and you know i think for most people it is if they work i'm just preaching yeah but you're putting stuff up i mean it's a lot of this is stuff that should have been put up years ago but you're actually taking the time to do it so it, it is work and it is valuable do little one uh heather says you should do little one minute snippets on tiktok i don't even have tiktok anymore that's the uh, chinese government's eyes into your daily life and lifestyle and habits I so i deleted it and james says he deleted it too for the same reasons or other reasons it's just too time consuming yeah he deleted it because it's too time consuming um when you say the state court is that like through risk management thing and they didn't deny it i don't understand the question uh, oh yeah james is telling me if i didn't answer if there's any questions i didn't answer please send them to caps and stem at gmail.com james is cutting me off he says we've been an hour this is supposed to be like 15 minutes and uh we got a roll so anyway we'll go to the outro uh, thank you everyone for attending tonight's session. Tomorrow we're at 6.30 p.m. It'll be volume one, part two of Gene, Gene Burns. Remember, if you have any questions at all, please email them to capstonstemslaw at gmail.com. And uh, as you already know, we're, we're going to be answering questions to the extent we can. We're going to try to keep it to like 15 minutes or so, but we'll uh, answer the questions to the extent we can that we get in, you know, if I was an in attorney, each stream. He answer questions. If James were an attorney, he could answer questions. That's a good point. <laughs> and so you attorney. better get working on it. Uh, if anyone's enjoying the content, I assume you are because you're here still for the most part. Uh, please show your support, especially for James and all his hard work getting this together by liking, sharing, commenting, and subscribing, and letting all your friends and everybody else know. And then for anyone who subscribed to the Patreon, we're going to upload Pellerin versus Wagner, the, the Pellerin versus Wagner public docket entries 301 through 400 tomorrow. And then the Gene Burns full uncut video will be on Patreon later tonight. Oh, and then we're going to also upload the Shanks complaint tomorrow. And we'll upload the Shanks complaint tomorrow, the first amended and complaint. The, the jury and the jury instructions. Is it second? Okay, it's Shank's second amended complaint and the jury instructions. We'll upload those tomorrow. And in the meantime, you guys all have a wonderful rest of your evening, and we'll see you tomorrow at 6.30. Thanks for joining us.